So, with, um, with our conference theme as disruptive innovation, it's appropriate we think about innovation in the scholarly communication area. We've already started to do that. What I'd like to do is to focus on a particularly interesting, potentially disruptive innovation, which is open access mega journals. Now, it's 10 years since PLOS One was launched. PLOS One is often seen as the exemplar medical journal. And in, the t in that time since its launch, it has now become the largest journal globally. Particularly in the last five years, a number of publishers, both mainstream established publishers and also uh, new entrants to the market, have launched PLOS One-like journals, mega journals. And in that time, mega journals have become a subject of increasing debate and of controversy. On the positive side, there are a number of people who look at mega journals and see the future of scholarly communication. As early as 2010, Joseph Esposito, the well-known commentator and contributor to the Scholarly Kitchen blog, said that PLOS One points to the future of academic publishing. In 2013, Richard Wellen, the Canadian scholar, in his article about the political economy of mega journals, talked about mega journals as having some of the classic characteristics of disruptive innovations. And as recently as 2015, Jean-Claude Guédon, the well-known scholarly communication commentator, when discussing the, the future of the, the best scholarly communication system suggested that subsidised mega journals would be the best system. And yet, on a more negative side, there have been a, a lot of criticisms of mega journals. Uh, some have suggested that mega journals are little more than a dumping ground for lower quality content that um, reduce the valuable function of selective journals in terms of filtering. For some, uh, particularly early career researchers, it's been suggested that contributing to mega journals amounts to career suicide. And others have seen uh, mega journals as little more than a cynical money making ploy by publishers. Now, the interesting thing about these comments, the more negative ones, is it's very difficult to attribute them because what happens in debates is that people say, well, people say they're a dumping ground, or my supervisor suggests it would be career suicide, but actually it's very difficult to get quotes, and I've tried to get these, it's, it's very difficult. But nevertheless, I think we can conclude that those negative views are very much in the air, however difficult it is to attribute them, and they're certainly quite embedded in some disciplinary communities. Now what this controversy does is it illustrates, at the very least, that mega journals are uh, a topic that merit, merit further systematic investigation. And that's exactly what a number of colleagues and I are now doing. We set up a project which is funded by AHRC, has just got going, it's a two-year project that is a collaboration between Sheffield and Loughborough. And we're investigating the place of mega journals within the scholarly communication environment and their potential um, for the future. As you can see, we've got a sequential design here that uses both quantitative and qualitative approaches to get a, a multiple perspectives on this phenomenon, if you like. The first two phases, uh, the literature review and the bibliometrics analysis, are now well underway, and we're preparing the, the, the next two phases, three and four, which are qualitative studies, carrying out interviews with publishers uh, and academic editors, and also discipline-based focus groups. And then we're going to move on, informed by those different phases, to a large-scale author-based survey. Now, that's how the project is, is looking. But one of the first problems we're encountering is defining the phenomenon itself, defining mega-journals. And views differ on this, but they all have similar sorts of um, elements to them. First of all, we're assuming that mega journals are fully open access, uh, first of all. Then, uh, moving on from that, one of the key features of mega journals is their wide scope. Now, apart from the very highly selective journals like Nature, over the last 50 years, the trajectory of journal publishing has, has been to develop titles which are 
further and further specialized, okay? What mega journals do is completely reverse that trend by having um, journals of a very broad scope. PLOS One covers all the science and technology and medicine disciplinary areas. Uh, AIP Advances, the physics uh, mega journal, covers all of the disciplinary or subdisciplinary areas of physics. So breadth of scope is one of their key characteristics. Also, they're defined by their particular approach to quality control. And this has two components to it. Both of them are important. First of all, there is an emphasis in the quality control on scientific soundness only, not on identifying the novelty or importance of a journal article. Now, highly selective journals or selective journals have traditionally focused on this question of, is this novel? Is this important? And that judgment is made by peer reviewers who are <coughs> effectively gatekeepers. Peer reviewers and editors who are effectively gatekeepers of their scientific community. Now this basically says, we'll only select on scientific soundness, we leave judgments of novelty and importance to the community as a whole. And the way that's done is this second component of um, quality control, which is around post-publication metrics. So you identify how people are behaving in relation to the article in terms of their usage or citation, and the community therefore decides. That's the argument. Now those uh, second and third characteristics lead probably to the final one, which is about scale. PLOS One has become the largest journal in the world, as I've said, publishing well over uh, 31,000 articles in 2014. Other mega journals have that as a stated aim, but haven't got there yet, and that in itself is an interesting uh, question. Now, both Christa Bjork has formalised many of these um, elements of the definition as you can see, the, the primary criteria correspond pretty much to what I've said. He's also identified these secondary criteria, which may or may not be true of different mega journals. Now, as you can see, there are some subjective elements to this. Of course, there are. What does big publishing volume actually mean? But this is a useful working definition that we are, that we are using if, if trying to refine somewhat. And that results in identification of these titles. On the left-hand side are the titles which meet the Bjork criteria. Um, and that's 20 or so titles there, many of which I'm sure will be uh, familiar to you with the publishing volumes if they're covered by Scopus. On the right, interesting enough, we have a number of titles which are thought of by many as mega journals, but don't meet the review, the quality control criteria in various different ways. And it's interesting that some of the humanities journals are in that category. And we'll, we'll be hearing um, about o OLH uh, later in this conference. In terms of output, this is what the output looks like. Now you can see here, these are uh, the 14 mega journals identified by York according to his strict cri criteria. Um, you can see they're dominated by PLOS One. That's the blue area there. PLOS One um, output has declined since 2013, but it's about made up for by Nature Scientific Reports, which is quite interesting. Other titles are growing, but at a much slower uh, rate. So I thought it would be useful for us then, having defined the terms that we're talking about, to think about ways in which this phenomenon could be regarded as disruptive. And I've identified three major ways which are to do with the economics of the business model, to do with quality control, and to do with the future of the journal. I'd like to just run through those briefly uh, with you. So first of all, <laughs> economics and business models. <coughs> the key thing here is around the potential for economies of scale. Okay, So instead, if, if mega journals were to replace large numbers of different journals, instead of a large number of different titles, all with different quality cr criteria, all with different house styles, instead of that, you'd have a single set of processes and technologies and styles, you create economies of scale within the system. And what that enables is the development of a tiered system of scholarly communication with highly selective titles on top and then mega journals underneath that creating economies of scale. And what this interestingly does is it creates the potential for highly selective titles to go open access. 
Up until now, there has been an objection that, article, that uh, journals like Nature can't go open access because they're rejecting so many articles that are submitted to them and not getting any potential APC income from those that they couldn't sustain that kind of high selectivity in their business model. Now, this gives the opportunity for that to be, to be reversed. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. Just to mention before I do that, though, that this idea of economies of scale doesn't just benefit publishers. It could uh, benefit academics as well by removing or at least reducing the submission rejection, submission rejection spiral that all or pretty much articles go through as they aim high and then go down the ladder of um, impact factors in, until they find acceptance for their paper. Now, the, some of the benefits are that there are low barriers to entry here, potentially therefore creating more competition. But we are still seeing a market where there appears to be brand recognition and value still very much to the fore. Let me say a little bit though about this idea of economies of scale and a tiered system. This is what we're potentially looking at. This is what we've hypothesized and we, which we want to test further with our research. So you have this layer of highly selective titles and then moderately selective mega journal underneath. What this mega journal does because of the economies of scale is potentially provide financial subsidy to the highly selective title, allowing you therefore to run it in an open access environment. What the highly selective titles do in return is they provide reputational subsidy. I think we coined that term for, in this context, for the mega journal. So you can see, for instance, PLOS originally launched highly selective titles, PLOS Medicine, PLOS Biology, and so on. They are providing reputational subsidy to PLOS One, which in return is potentially providing financial subsidy to the highly selective titles. That's the model that we're thinking about it could be a future one in a scholarly new scholarly communication environment with open access as mainstream. And we want to test that out and how that actually is working. Moving on then to questions associated with this, there are multiple questions connected with this whole uh, set of ideas. Do you need mega journals to create this economies of scale? Many publishers now have backroom operations with selective titles on top. You may not need a mega journal approach to do that, which I think is an interesting. Um, uh, uh, question around here. Many people would say, well, you already have multiple tiers in the journal publishing, it's just mega journals are right at the bottom of them, you know. So, you know, that's, that, that's, that's an important question we need to, to look at. This, this is an interesting question. Does the tiered model create conditions for conflict of interest, where it's incentivized to accept more um, journal articles in the mega journal because you make more income? That's, an off, that's a common um, a fear of open access publishing in general, but some people have claimed that it creates more potential for predatory uh, journals. Interesting uh, question. And also, we, we definitely, are, I think, are seeing this reliance on publisher brands for this, um, this, this reputational subsidy. Can, is that always going to be there, is one of the key questions. So that's around economics. What about quality control? Well, the emphasis here, as I've said, on soundness and that reducing the subjectivity of the judgments around novelty and importance. But it does necessitate a robust post-publication metrics layer to actually then assess what is important and what is novel. It may be that we haven't got there yet. One of the really interesting things about this, though, is that it potentially shifts the role and the power of the gatekeepers. Up until now, these very senior people in their subject communities, the editors, the editorial board members, have been the arbiters of what is novel and what is important in their field. If they're now only being asked to make assessments of what is sound, then that reduces the influence of the gatekeepers. And I think it's, it's interesting to think about what the consequences of that might be. But that's its potential whether for good or for ill. It could argue either way. And that leads on to these questions of, um, <clears throat> are mega journals just peer review light? You know, is it a lower quality threshold that's being accepted? And also, does this idea of soundness apply in different disciplinary areas? How does it apply in the humanities, for example? Um, 
I, I've yet to find a, a convincing explanation uh, of, of that, which I think is, is interesting. Also, the, the, the idea, this is put forward by Richard Wellen in his article on mega journals, is that all of this kind of signals a danger in the current higher education community of an over reliance or a potential over reliance on metrics as a basis for making judgments about all sorts of things, including funding uh, going forward. And whether it is a, a good or a wise thing to do to dispense with the wisdom of the expert in favour of the wisdom of the crowd is an open question. The wis wisdom of the expert, that is the, the peer reviewer, the gatekeeper, it, it, and the wisdom of the academic crowd, I guess is what we're saying. But that's effectively what seems to be happening. The third uh, and final area of possible disruption is this uh, area of the, 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 the role of the journal going forward. As, as I've said, it reverses a 50-year, at least a 50-year trend in more specialization in journal uh, publishing, and therefore potentially creates a number of conditions. One is around interdisciplinarity, and that isn't just because you've got articles from different disciplines in the same place, but also because people don't have to write, potentially at least, people don't have to write articles to fit within a given niche. They can write articles across disciplines that are more likely to be accepted one might argue, by a mega journal. Because it, effectively what mega journals are is a massive repository of quality controlled content, some people have suggested actually it points away from the journal at all to, the, to, a, to an emphasis on the article and create the potential for post-publication overlay services on top of mega journal content and indeed content from other places uh, as well. And potentially, it's might it's my argue, it might be argued that that could create layers for people outside the academy to use this content. That's, that's the argument. But some people might say, well, a lot of these trends are happening anyway, regardless of mega journals. What mega journals might be doing is highlighting them, making them clearer, magnifying them, if you like, so we can, that we can keep an eye and look at them and understand their significance. But this question about fundamental disciplinary differences remains. And one of the things we're going to be doing in the project is looking quite carefully at how disciplinary communities are responding potentially differently to this um, phenomenon. How much time have I got? Because I've got some numbers to show, but I think I'm probably running out of time. OK, so let me be reasonably selective in this. This is some early figures from our bibliometrics exercise. And what this, what this shows is looking at... Um, Looking at quality um, in terms of citation being a proxy measure for quality. And this is the nature uh, titles. Nature at the very top. Sorry about the very highly selective. Um, it's a superlative, busy description, I realise, but um, I apologise for that. But we've got three layers here, interesting enough, um, going down to scientific re re um, reports. Now, what this shows is that selectivity does increase, um, it, or apparently, increase quality if measured by citations. You can see over 50% of articles in Nature are cited more than 50 times, whereas for scientific reports, that's only 3.5%. But you can see, actually, this layering pretty clearly in this citation uh, analysis. Now, remember that grey curve... Then that, this is uh, what it looks like compared with other mega journals. Um, you can see them defined here. So the grey curve is like nature science reports, then plus one is, is green, and so on. What this shows is a citation pattern that is more normal. But as you get as you push into the top right hand corner, we're seeing fewer citations for um, uh, a large number of or a, a significant number of, of journals, and it does lead to the question of this idea of dumping grounds, but also the extent to which these are based on issues to do with publisher reputation, and that leading to author behaviour in terms of submission, but also maybe in terms of citations. That's an open, that's an open question um, that we're looking at. This is interesting. A very interesting comparison, Medicine, published by Kluwer, used to be a highly selective title, publishing very few articles per year. About 18 months ago, it turned itself into a mega journal with changed quality criteria and so on. And what we saw is a significant shift in the 
uh, demographics of people submitting to the journal. There was a rise between um, the people who were submitting here in terms of numbers, say, from France and Spain, of submissions between those years. But we can see there's a massive rise in the mega journal in submissions from Far Eastern countries compared with the highly selective journal. And that it tells a story in many respects about what's going on in scholarly communication in general, the rise of um, uh, Far Eastern authors, but that is really <coughs> magnified in this shift uh, that's happening um, for the mega journal. And there's been a lot of debate uh, in social media about the merits of this transition, but they basically said we couldn't afford to maintain a highly selective, ti uh, highly selective title. Uh, which is interesting. It's an interesting question whether you can, whether you need both the highly selective and the mega journal in concert, or whether you can run one or the other in isolation. And that's an interesting question we need to investigate. So we're carrying on with our investigations. This we just really started. One of the things I want to mention to you, though, is that one of the key parts of this is phase four, which is our disciplinary focus groups. And I'm hoping that I will be in contact with some of you in the near future saying, can you host some focus groups for us looking at particular disciplinary areas which we will um, uh, tell you about. And I'm, I'm very much hoping that we'll be able to hold disciplinary focus groups in a number of, like Russell Group, institutions only because just the sheer numbers of scientists and other scholars that you've got in your institution. So um, be prepared. I may well be sending you an, an email in the near future and I'd be very grateful for your help. If you want more information about the project, you can see the URL uh, there. Let me just say one thing about what we're doing in terms of um, investigating the role of different stakeholder communities. I want to talk to librarians, I want to talk to publishers, that's important. One of the things that's become very clear uh, in, in this, though, is the need, if you like, for librarians in particular to be informed and to be credible in their understanding about these kinds of issues. Now, I know Danny is going to talk about this next up, and I have got very used to being Danny's warm-up act uh, <laughs> at conferences, but... I, <laughs> And I, so I think this is really important that if librarians in their institutions are going to play a prominent role in affecting policy and strategy in this area, as well as advising on individual decisions for scholars, we as a community have got to be strong in terms of our grasp of these kinds of issues that affect uh, researchers. Now, I would argue that as a community, the librarian community has, be, has got a very strong record in this area, but it's not something we can be complacent about. And so there's something, there is still an ongoing need to keep up to date and to be, remain credible in this area if, to, if we're to influence change. Thank you very much for listening.